a webinar on today. My name is Stacy Holt Ely. I'm the project manager for the Advanced Rental Education Program at Fresenius Medical Care in North America. Next slide. On behalf of our program, I would like to thank the ESRD Network Number Eight for their partnership to support the renal community through education. I also want to extend our gratitude and sincere appreciation to you, the clinicians on the front lines, for your unfailing dedication to provide the best possible care to our CKD and ESKD patients during this unprecedented pandemic. Before we begin, please let me provide a brief overview of our program and introduce our amazing speaker, Dr. Mike Kraut. Our program is an educational service provided by Fresenius Medical Care North America. We are endorsed by the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis and the International Society for Hemodialysis. We work closely with a network of distinguished faculty and clinicians to offer up-to-date and evidence-based educational materials to support you advocating for home therapies and improving the care outcomes for CKD and ESRD patients. We are committed to support committed to support the renal community through collaboration, outreach, and education, advocating for home dialysis. We have developed a dedicated website, as shown here, um, advancedrenaleducation.com, where you may access a wide range of free e-learning courses, as well as an extensive library of review articles on various topics, ranging from general topics on CKD, to modality educations on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Next slide. There are also user-friendly tools such as the PD calculator shown here and the newly launched HHD calculator. These tools will allow you to enter a patient's parameters, generate the estimated prescription data, which provides general guidance for finding the right prescription for your patient. Next slide. As you can see, the HHD calculator, calculator is pretty similar, but obviously they are different in nature. The next slide. You can register as a user to access any of our CE courses. You may view all of the courses, track your progress, and obtain your CE certificates on your own personalized e-learning dashboard. On our symposia page, we post registration for all of our webinars, and we also provide on-demand links to the prior webinars. As a registered e-learner, you will receive AREP announcements on new courses and webinar offerings. Next slide. Next slide. Without further ado, let me introduce this amazing speaker that we have for you today, Dr. Mike Krause. I have the pleasure of working with him. Dr. Krauss is the Associate Chief Medical Officer with Fresenius Care Incorporated since February of 2019 after the merger with Next Stage Medical. From December 2017 to February 2019, he was the Associate Chief Medical Officer and Senior Medical Advisor at Next Stage Medical. Prior to working for Next Stage, Dr. Krauss has held several positions and titles at Indiana University Health and in the Indiana University School of Medicine, including service line chief for IU health physicians, kidney diseases, and chief medical officer of IU health adult dialysis services. Dr. Krauss is a leader in the field of short daily home hemodialysis and a well-published internationally recognized invited speaker. He is the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Kidney Foundation of Indiana, as well as the Sagamore of the Wabash, if I'm, you can correct me if, if I'm mispronouncing that, Dr. Krause, which is the highest award presented to a citizen of Indiana. Thank you so much for your attention. Let's welcome Dr. Krause, our speaker for today. Here we go. Thanks, Stacey. That was a very nice introduction. And uh, thanks, Casey, for inviting me. First, congratulations. That that rise in home dialysis in your network is, is outstanding. And I'm glad that we're able to help you wherever we can. Uh, and to everybody on the phone, use these resources. These are great educational tools, both from your network. Renal networks have a, a great set of resources and obviously from the Advanced Renal Education Program. They're, they're open to all. You don't have to be a Fresenius associated physician, nurse, or 
or PCT. It can be anybody can get into these programs very easy to register and there are no costs. Uh, and the same thing obviously true from your network. So use those things. And, and uh, repeating Stacy's, uh, thank you for taking care of your patients. I can't say it enough. This has been an unbelievable year with lots of stress on all of us, disease on some of us and disease on a lot of our patients. And, and finally, before I start, I, I, I encourage you to get your vaccines if you haven't, to speak positively about vaccines to your patients because it's gonna save our patients' lives. This is a really, really big deal. If you have any questions about vaccines, reach out to me. I'm easy to find, uh, and I'll be more than happy to discuss it with you. So I, I feel very strongly about that. But the other thing I feel very strongly about is obviously moving people home and transitioning them and giving them the best care. Uh, and, and when we talk about transitions, it's not only the transition everybody thinks of going from CKD to ESRD, it's every transition point in your patient's lives and all of your patients will have multiple transition points. So it's our job to watch those very carefully and take good care of them and make sure we manage them through those transitions. I'll go ahead and look at the next slide, please, Casey. Uh, let's go to the next slide, read quick. So the, the bottom, uh, uh, what we'd like to get through today so that we're all on the same page, we'll, we'll review some of these important transition points. We'll discuss transitional care units, which I think are, if done exceedingly well, will be the future of how we provide care to patients, because I think we can improve those outcomes as we'll look at, and we'll look at methods to look at uh, uh, screening for home hemo, screening for peritoneal dialysis. We need to grow both. We can't just grow one or the other. So when you think of home, don't think of just PD or don't just think of HHD, think about everything. And then we'll also talk some of the, the newer nuances of incremental start dialysis, uh, urgent start PD, as well as the frequent necessary transition from PD to both in-center and home hemodialysis. Next slide, please. So let's move right into these transitions, right? Uh, and the point is, as I said, the transitions are many in your patient's life. And I know we think of this, uh, you know, starting from advanced CKD to dialysis is the most common one. And, and there's lots of things we can do. And the patients obviously could do preemptive transplant if we're good or we're able to get that done. Obviously there's in, there's hemodialysis versus PD. And then when you talk about hemo, there's home versus in center. And then importantly, as we look at our patients' needs, I'm a huge believer in frequency to meet your patients' clinical needs. But these transition that's not the only transition. And yes, that's the one we focus on with transitional care, but keep in mind that your patients transplant and transition to and from transplant. Uh, transplants fail, transplants go in, and th those are important as well that your patient understands what those are and understands the medication changes and how that affects their lives and what they're going to do both socially and, and psychosocially as well as medically. Uh, and then remember patients move from one, one, one uh, form of dialysis to another, particularly from uh, either in center to home, either PD or home hemo, and then PD to a, a form of hemodialysis either in center or at home as well as as well as changes in prescriptions. But I want you to focus and think about one that we frequently forget about, and that's that top upper right green square. The most common transition our patients have from the hospital to home, sometimes involving a skilled nursing facility, sometimes not. And we forget that. And we, we should look at these patients very carefully. They have a high mortality. If they're on a home therapy, they're at extremely high risk to fail home therapy and go back to in center. The costs associated with hospitalizations are a significant and the primary driver in the cost of dialysis care overall. So when your patient goes home from the hospital, I want you to make sure you see them, touch them, go over their medications, make sure they're not on two different ACE inhibitors because they were on one at home and one in the hospital and they went were discharged on the wrong one or whatever. So view those medications, make sure they got the antibiotics. But think about what put them in the hospital. Most of our hospitalizations are caused by volume overload of one source or another, cardiovascular disease. We can impact that with proper prescription, proper modality, and making sure we give the patient the right therapy and the right prescription every single day. So when my patient comes back from the hospital, I gotta ask myself, did the way I do dialysis, 
the prescription I give dialysis or maybe the modality of dialysis have anything to do with that and can I impact that? If it's cardiovascular hospitalizations frequently, it's time to think about maybe going home and doing more frequent dialysis to prevent that next hospitalization. Uh, understand what we can do. That's a huge transition for all our patients, so keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the problem, right? And this is, we're looking at the, the one transition we talked about going from CKD to hemodialysis, but this graph on the left of your screen it shows what my biggest concern is. When patients start dialysis in the United States, their risk of death and hospitalization is the greatest in the first 10 to 20 weeks, and particularly in the first three to four weeks. We have to think about what we're doing, how we initiate patients on dialysis, and how we can impact that. So when I think of transitional care, when we designed transitional care back before I was a physician, and now that I'm with, with Fresenius, the goal is not to send people home. I know that surprises some of you. The goal is first and foremost to reduce death and hospitalizations, to get more fishes and get the patients to preemptive transplant and educate those patients. We do all of those things. We'll get the patients home. I'm not too worried about that, but I've got to reduce hospitalizations to improve value and obviously mortality is huge and we have to think about that. So that's the goal is to impact this graph. Next slide. And so there are lots of difficulties with, with, with uh, transitions or barriers, and we just have to think about and walk our way through them. Uh, the, the, the biggest, you know, when you look at patients, particularly when they go home, you've, you've got to understand how, what are we doing wrong? What is causing these transitions to be dangerous, causing our patients to have issues? And it's the simple things a lot of the time. It's not knowing what went on in the hospital. It's not communicating with the doctor that took care of them in the hospital or the nephrologist that lowered their weight three kilos and now they're back up two kilos. Uh, if we don't have those communications, we don't coordinate our care, that's where we get into trouble. We don't look at the medicines, make sure again, we're not on two different meds that are the same, but because in the hospital they get a generic of this one and when they go home they were on a different one. Very important to make sure they got their prescriptions filled. Antibiotics won't do any good if you didn't get it at the pharmacy on your way home. Understand those things, understand what the barriers are, and let's let's get those patients taken care of. The patients also have those those those, those concerns or confusions and barriers about good care when they leave or they transition. You know, when they transition to ESRD, they may not be prepared for it. They, they may not have been educated as well as they should or didn't listen when we tried to educate them. You know, when they're going into a in-center unit, the in-center unit is designed to take care of a lot of patients and is designed to take care of a lot of patients in the same way. And it's not designed to look at incident patients differently from prevalent patients. I mean, we have policies and procedures and we try to do those things but that's not how the unit runs day to day. So think about, it's like going to a rehab hospital after a long hospitalization. You want to go where they're thinking about what your problem is today. You want to go to nurses who specialize in incident population, specialize in getting patients prepared for dialysis, have the time to educate, the time to reassess and reevaluate that patient, maybe a little bit more closely every day than they than the patient that's prevalent needs. So understand all those things, figure out what our problems are, make sure we get the records from the hospitals, make sure we know what the patient looked like before they were on dialysis or what happened during that case so we can reevaluate with the best prescription, best therapy, see if they need a transitional care unit, see if they need to switch to PD or to more frequent dialysis or home hemo. Next slide, please. So let's focus a little bit on these transitional care units. This is a new concept to many of us. It, it is growing and certainly there are over a hundred transitional care units in the United States today. And in some areas there's actually quite a few of them, um, but it's still in the process of trying to understand what it is. So again, I want you to think of two things. One, as we discussed before, rehab. We're taking a very sick patient and we're providing them specific care during that first four to six weeks to rehabilitate them, to get them to go from their transition and usually that, that in-center CKD to 
renal replacement therapy. That's that's what we all think about frequently. That's that's what we're going to see in the transitional care. That's rehab, but it's also specialized nursing. If I have my hip replaced, they don't send me to the cardiac floor. The cardiac nurses are equally good to the orthopedic nurses, but the orthopedic nurse's job is one thing, to take care of that guy with the hip replacement. That's where I go. So when I am new to dialysis, I want to go to a place where I have specialized nursing, incident care nursing, very important. So the goals, again, of this is to, one, medically stabilize, and, the, and that's where more frequent dialysis plays a very big role. I can get your weight down safely. You don't crash. I can lower your blood pressure medications. I can get your medicines correctly. I can get to a dry weight. I can clear the cognitive dysfunction. And importantly, I spend that first week also worrying about your emotional adjustment. A patient that starts dialysis is depressed. They're anxious. They're confused. They may have cognitive dysfunction. They may be extremely angry. It is very important to address those issues before you try to talk about modality selection or even how to care for yourself with chronic kidney disease. You can't absorb information if you're not emotionally ready there. So transitional care unit focuses on getting that emotional adjustment, coordinating the care between the physician, the nurses, the vascular surgeon, the, the transplant center is exceedingly important. And then once you emotionally and medically stabilize them, you get the care where you want it, then it's time to educate them. Bring in the importance of why you want to come to dialysis, why you, adherence is important, why your medicines are important, why your diet is important, what the kidney disease to you, and how then can we treat it moving into home modalities. Give them the options to take care of themselves, to understand what all the modalities are. So at the end of the day, when, you com when your patient completes a, 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 a transitional care unit program, they're referred to transplant, they're referred to vascular access, they're medically stable, they're emotionally adjusted, and they're well-educated, which allows them and their family to make that informed modality choice. So they understand. That's what person-centered care depends on everything else to get to the point where I can make an informed decision. Next, next slide, please. So the question then is, who do I say? We, we know what the goals of the TCU is. It's rehab. It's specialized nursing. It's getting the patient medically and emotionally stable to be able to make good decisions. Who should we send there? And the answer is or could be anybody going through a transition. Whether it's a planned start or an urgent start doesn't matter. Whether I did free dialysis education doesn't matter. Send them there because you know what? You may have talked to me before, but I didn't need dialysis, and I may not have paid as much attention as you thought I did. But now that I'm on dialysis, I am emotionally ready, I'm physically ready, <laughs> temporarily ready to learn. So everybody goes there. Failed transplants. Next, week. Failed transplants are some of your most depressed patients. They're high-risk patients. They have high risk of hospitalizations and death. Take good care of them. Send them to the TCU. If they're going from PD back to in-center dialysis, the TCU may be a good place to go, and maybe you can move them back to home hemo once you get them stable again, too. So it's not a bad thought uh, to get that patient to go through there. And anybody, you know, think about, again, those transitions from hospital or skilled nursing facilities. Do they need the TCU? Do they need the education, the support that I provide from that? Do they need maybe to try experience the difference to see what more frequent dialysis does from? understand what the patient's needs are, send them the right place, but certainly send almost all transitioning patients through a TCU. Don't pick and choose. The, the wrong use of a TCU is I'm only going to send the patients I want to go home to the TCU. I'm not sure what that accomplishes. If I send all those patients to the TCU and I get 80% to go home, have I failed on 20%? Am I doing well? If I send every single patient to the TCU, I can watch and see if my home penetration for incident patient rises? And that's the question. Next slide. So what does the TCU look like? It can look like anything. And I'll be honest with you, my favorite model for a TCU would be the one to the far right up there, where the TCU sits in your home department. Now, understand that a transitional care unit, by definition, bills as a home unit, right? Or I'm sorry, bills as an in-center unit. So it has to be surveyed for an in-center unit. So if you do that in your home department, you've got to have an in-center unit survey and a, a, a ability to do that. The problem with that one on the far right, which I prefer because it keeps patients out of my in-center unit, 
is it takes bricks and mortar. I don't have that. So the bottom line is what most of my TCUs are going to look like because I can do it today. I don't have to be resurveyed. I don't have to build new dialysis units, knock out walls and build chairs, is the one up in the upper left there, the one where the TCU is a pod within your in-center floor. That is likely what you're gonna see in the bulk of your patients today. It's just easier to accomplish in a rapid motion. I, like I said, I have chairs, they're in-center chairs. I can make them TCU chairs. I don't need to be recertified, resurveyed. It's all set and ready to go. So that's likely how you're gonna see most of it. Understand though, that I may start with a standard conventional dialysis machine but by week three, I'm gonna be rolling in a home hemodialysis machine so the patient can touch, feel, and taste what a home hemodialysis machine looks like. So you have to plan for that. I'm gonna have available PD cyclers, PD bags, things for the patient to test to discuss peritoneal dialysis. So I'm going to have everything I need to begin to introduce home very aggressively to these patients, not train them on home, but introduce them to them so they can make that decision. And you make that decision by understanding what the device looks like, whether you can see it, whether you can, your hands are able to do the manipulations needed and whether you would be comfortable. But it's very important, again, that you don't make patients crash because you, you make somebody drop their blood pressure to 70, drop them on their head, resuscitate them, turn down their TMP. You, you may say, well, it happens. But if it happens to me, I'm not gonna go home. I'm gonna say, I can't, couldn't tolerate this at home. So it's very important that we do the more frequent dialysis and get the patients safely in here in a position where, where they can see both home therapies as well as in-center. Next slide. So there is a suggested prescription. This is from Dr. Bowman, and I'll be honest with you, I don't agree with much of it. What I agree with, it doesn't matter what device I use, but eventually I want the patient to touch the home device, I believe, and this is my own personal belief, that these patients have medical indications for five-day-a-week dialysis most of the time, if not all of the time. I'd like to get rid of that two-day gap, which means you have to include Saturday. I might, you know, depending how I do my transitional unit, I could do transitional unit Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, but I have an in-center spot on Saturday. Those are things that your business people have to work on and, and, and figure out what you want to do, but I want to go at least five days a week. Uh, ultrafiltration to me, eight or less. I don't want my patient to drop their blood pressure. There's no reason to make a patient experience cramping, experience hypotension, experience all the things we see in standard conventional dialysis. You want symptom-free dialysis up front with transitional and the ability to remove fluid. That's where frequency comes in. That's where ultrafiltration rate in my mind is eight cc's per kilo per hour or less. Next slide. So the TCU is clearly a team, which is Wonderful. I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm focusing on bringing the team back to the interdisciplinary team. We take care of patients as a team. We specifically have to take care of the patients as a team within the TCU. It's not just a single nurse that does this. It's not just a single doctor. There's got to be the relationship, the families involved, because you can't make a decision on home therapies without including your circle of support. So we've got to include them. And obviously, dietitians, the changes in the going through people's lives is huge, and that includes diet. Home therapy staff should be involved, but not doing the process. We have a se separate transitional care so staff. You know, you've got to get the vascular access in, so you've got to figure out how you're going to do that. Social worker is an integral part to a good transitional care unit. Uh, so all of the people are important. You know, we have education set up. We have a whole education team that's helped us develop it. So it's, 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 all, it's everybody. This is not one person's job. TCU, like delivering good care, is clearly teamwork. Next slide. And we walk patients through, and I'm not going to spend detailed effort on the slide, but you walk patients through the journey. And yes, we have a roadmap, and yes, we have a very consistent plan of education with the same curriculum for everybody delivered in the way that the patient needs to learn. But be assured that you have to be flexible. You've got to get through the assurance of the patient before you can do anything else. And if that takes two weeks, it takes two weeks. If we think most of the time we can get by in one week, and we think most of the time we can get through a four-week transitional care unit, but certain patients may take more time. So you've got to have a little bit of flexibility. But again, first things first, make the patient safe and comfortable so 
support them emotionally and get their med medical condition safe. Most important thing to do. Then you can walk through the next week with kidney failure and begin the discussion of modality options, followed by more in-depth education of modality, transplantation, access, PD and home hemo, very specific. By week three, they're learning, they're sponging, they're, they're sucking this up because they understand the importance of it. And then it gives you time to discuss what is best for you as the patient. As soon as they say, I wanna do PD, you get them scheduled for a PD access. By week four, you better have them scheduled for a transplant referral if they're medically eligible. So those are things we wanna do, but you wanna give them time to get there. Next slide. And I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this slide and ignore the right half for me. That's way too many words. The bottom line is there aren't a lot of studies on TCUs to date. There are a few and they're positive. They're not you know, they have, they have their issues, but when we look at this, the goals again of TCU should be to decrease hospitalizations, mortality, and we're beginning to see that. We're, we and my company have seen a lot more transitional care units and we're beginning to see that. I'm comfortable that I think we're going to get there. We want to grow home, that's obviously a, a good importance and we see that. The important things to me also are shortening the referral, transplant referral times and getting better access. And we're, we're and that's the important part. We need to study this more. So I don't want you to hang your hat on these things yet, but this is the direction we want to go. We have evidence that this sounds like it, it's where we're going, but we need to study it a little bit closer. Next slide. So how do you know which patients are good for home or which home therapy? And, and, and the, the good tools out there, and I spend a little bit of time on there because you can have your own tools, your dialysis organization may have them as well but they're different for patients and for clinicians. These are both from MEI or homedialysis.org, the Medical Education Institute. But I have seen people give their patients the MATCHD. The MATCHD is not for the patient. It's for you, the nurse, you, the social worker, you, the physician. This is for you to look at and figure out how you get patients home. And you'll notice they're green, yellow, and red for both PD and home hemo. And the red are the absolute contraindications, if you will. And even them, you know, I think some of those we can work on. The yellow is the important part. The yellows are patients that some of us would not have moved home before. But they tell you you can, and they help you get there. So that's a nice tool to look at. You know, it's not the end all be all, but it's a really good tool. And then for the patients, I really do like this. My life, my dialysis, my choice. It just goes through their their, their, their goals in life, their priorities, to help them decide which therapy might fit into their priorities. And I'll admit, that at the end of the day, these have a slant towards home, but I have a slant towards home, so that's okay. But the bottom line is it looks at what the patient really wants to accomplish and helps them look at the different modalities. Uh, a very useful tool that you, they can do it in the clinic or they can do it at home on their own. It's very easy to get to. Next slide. So why might somebody choose PD first? PD first is a good option for those patients that want a very simple therapy, that aren't opposed to a peritoneal dialysis catheter, and particularly when they have good residual renal function. And we believe that preserving residual renal function is important for our patients in terms of morbidity and perhaps mortality. So PD does appear to be a little bit gentler, especially compared to thrice weekly dialysis. We don't have good comparisons with more frequent dialysis, but thrice weekly dialysis, it looks to be fairly good at preserving that residual renal function. Clearly comparing it to in-center hemodialysis, patients say their quality of life is improved. Their independence is obviously improved because they don't have to come to dialysis. Um, first couple of years, mortality looks to be better, but the, again, those are things we put into context it's a safe, most patients can do peritoneal dialysis safely, and that's important to let them know. CAPD is the easiest thing, modality to train a patient to do, without a doubt. It's very simple, doesn't require electricity, does require a lot of storage, obviously, but those are the things. And if you start with PD, you can still educate them on what the future is gonna look like. I don't believe peritoneal dialysis is a lifelong therapy for most of our patients. 
If we can get them transplanted quickly, that would be great. If not, sooner or later, most of your patients are going to have to go to hemodialysis. So it gives you time to talk about both transplantation and home hemo. So when they go and, and it begin to need to go move transition, we can begin to get them home. And for those patients that don't have an AV fistula, crash into dialysis or just never got the surgery before they needed it, a PD catheter is, in my mind, much better than a hemodialysis catheter. So PD first makes a great therapy for those patients as well. And it does give you time to get that uh, AV fistula placed later. Next slide. The home hemodialysis patient is for patients that are looking for improved quality of life. Their blood pressures aren't well controlled. Phosphorus aren't well controlled. Uh, we believe that there's a survival advantage, and our studies tend to show that, and a reduced risk of infectious complications if you train the patient well. You must understand best demonstrated practices for infection control, and you must use them and work with your dialysis organization to make sure you've got all that. With home dialysis, particularly more frequent dialysis, I should be able to provide almost universal symptom-free dialysis, which is a big benefit to our patients. It allows them more flexibility and convenience. And always be careful, but there, there are less dietary and fluid restrictions depending how you dialyze. I never tell a patient you, you, you can stop worrying about salt and water re, uh, restrictions because all of our patients from CKD all the way through transplantation probably need salt and water restrictions with few exceptions. But Home hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis will allow some potassium. And if you do more frequent dialysis nocturnally, you should be able to get off phosphate binders and have almost a normal phosphorus diet. So there are some benefits to it. Next slide. So when we think about our in-center patients, because if you want to continue to grow home in your network, and I want you to, it's not just the incident patient that we've been talking about. It's also the prevalent patient. Because these are patients, in my mind, that aren't doing really well with more frequent dialysis or with in-center dialysis. And those are patients that are in the hospital for congestive heart failure, having problems with hypotension either during or between dialysis, or those patients that take four, six, eight, 12 hours to recover after dialysis. Patients whose blood pressure aren't well controlled, 150 over 90 on two to three meds. Hypertension in our population is almost all fluid. We can control that with home hemodialysis, particularly more frequently. Patients with LVH. If your patient's LVH, there's only one therapy in ESRD that works. It's not medications. It's more frequent dialysis. Uh, easily delivered at home, whether it's nocturnal or short. Every study has shown decrease in LVH in those patients. The thicker the heart, the better the reduction in LVH. I like to think about using things like N-terminal ProBNP. That is a good marker of fluid overload. Yes, it's elevated in all our patients, but it's how much it's elevated. If it's five to 600, those are felt to be eubulimic patients. Two to 3,000, those patients are fluid overloaded at higher risk for high, uh, hypertension, hospitalizations, arrhythmias, and even death. So I think the NT pro BNP could be a good biomarker. If your patients have high NT pro BNPs and you can't bring it down with thrice weekly dialysis, that patient would benefit or could benefit from more frequent dialysis and phosphorus. Think about that. The patient you walk by and every month you discuss phosphorus, every month you adjust their binders, every month they're doing their best and I can't control their phosphorus. More frequent dialysis reduces phosphorus, removes twice as much in daily and removes much more with nocturnal. Prescribed well, we can improve phosphorus in those patients as well. Next slide. So a couple other quick things we'll go over incremental urgent start and transition to uh, in uh, hemodialysis from PD. Next slide. And I don't want to spend a lot of time in incremental. There's a lot of thoughts there. The definitions aren't actually very good. Uh, and I'll tell you that even this slide shows you. Uh, so first for hemodialysis, it's less than three sessions per week. And remember these patients have to come in with residual renal function, have to come in with good urine outputs have, and sodium control, potassium control, and phosphorus control. Not a large percentage of our patients would do that. So the analysis that are done takes these perfect patients and compares them to the entire batch of in-center dialysis patients. So it's not a fair comparison. If you're gonna use it, you know, better measure urine output regularly, at least once a month, if not every other month. 
We better control phosphorus, better control potassium, and these patients shouldn't have high ultrafiltration rates. So they have to have a large urine volume. APD to me, less than five sessions per week is, is a problem. In, intermittent PD isn't modeled. So I have a, uh, a difficulty for less than seven days per week, frankly, with either APD or CAPD. But you, you'll have to adjust what you want. To me, APD for incremental is probably not the way I'd go. I, I would go with CAPD. So I can control salt and water with peritoneal dialysis. It's a daily problem with salt and water. It's not a three, four, five day a week problem. It's a daily problem. And three drugs a week allows you to write a prescription, which is fairly easy on the patient and is good for salt and water removal, which is a completely different conversation. But I think that's the direction I would go. Next slide. Urgent start PD, I think you're going to see more of that driven by the ETC, driven by the, uh, the KCC, the, the voluntary and the uh, mandatory models that are now coming to us from CMS because they want optimal start, which means you don't want uh, central venous catheters in any of your patients if you're in the voluntary model. So we're going to see that, but it, it basically is putting a catheter in when the patient requires it. Again, it's not for all patients. If your patient presents massively fluid overload with a potassium of seven and a half, that patient probably needs hemodialysis to be stabilized before you start PD, but you can still go to urgent start PD after you stabilize that patient. So when you set up that urgent start PD program, you're going to understand the best patients for that program, just like you do for your incremental PD, and you have to have everything in place to be able to have a good program. Next slide. And we'll go to the next slide. We'll short on time. So the other thing we want to do is think about patients that transition from PD to home hemo. We know the average patient on PD stays on for less than two years. And we know that if we can help them plan to go to hemodialysis, they do better, right? So patients that plan for it have less hospitalization, less fish, uh, more fistulas, more self-care, and, and have done better. Again, this study is not exactly apples to apples, but you get the, the, the overall point. Planning is almost always desirable for our patients. Unplanned changes are, are usually with hospitalizations and, and morbidity. Next slide. But the key point is, on the next slide, is where you go, in my opinion, and this is where the planning matters. This was an excellent match study. This was comparing apples to apples as best we can. Um, and the patients that went home for hemodialysis versus in center did better with survival and transplantation. More likely to get transplanted in the next two years, more likely to survive. That's obviously our goals of therapy. So talking to your patients as they progress towards the need of switching, getting them to understand the benefits of home hemo, maybe using transitional care to transition them to home hemo could be an excellent point. But this is what we want. We want better survival and better transplantation. Next slide. So at the end of the day, I think a TCU can be, as long as we put them in place correctly, can be a very useful place for our patients to go. If we can prove that we get the benefits we think we can, it should be the direction we go of the future. We have lots of tools out there to help you identify which patients might do best which, with, with which therapies, and you should use it, and understand what the transitions should look for, plan for these transitions, and think about whether you can do things like urgent start PD or transitional care units in your own programs, and understand where PD and HHD fit in for your patients, whether incident or prevalent. Next slide. I think we're ready for questions, if I'm not. Yep, we are. So uh, I'll go ahead and open the microphone to Casey, Marion, and Stacy, and you can see if we got any questions. Thank you, Dr. Krause. Oh, that was such an excellent presentation. Lots of good information. Um, I know that we have had a few questions to come in, and I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question, please enter that into the chat box and be sure that you address that to all panelists. Um, Marion, would you like to ask the first question? Um, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you again, Dr. Krause. Um, it looks like we do have a question here. 
Um, how long is too long to allow a patient to decide on their choice of modality? Uh, I don't think there is an answer to that question. I mean, everybody is individual and we shouldn't force people. Now, the question may be, how long can I keep you in transitional care, right? Um, and that, you know, if I've given you all the education and you're just laying around playing there because you like the nurse, you know, five, six weeks is probably too long and it's time to move on. But, you know, if that four week course takes me eight weeks because I'm 85 years old, and a little bit slower, and I'm not picking everything up as quickly as some of somebody that might be younger. That's fine. So it's it, it's individualized. I don't have a too long today. You know, in, in a year or two, I might change my opinion. But as long as I understand why you're there, and we're making progress, it's like rehab, right? You've got to be making progress every day. And if you're not making progress, it's time to discuss where you're best served, whether it's going to a sniff or going home at that point of time. So it's, it's very, very similar to those things. And th we should be open-minded to those things. Dr. Cross, I've got another question here. What sure. tactics do you and your teams employ to engage the patient's family during COVID? Oh, that's an excellent question and a hard one too. I hate the hard questions. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a big believer in using telehealth. I'm a big believer in the advantages of telehealth. Uh, and using the platforms appropriately. And unfortunately, we've gotten to a point where everybody thinks telehealth is the doctor-patient visit. It's not. It's my educators. It's my, it's my patient advocates. It's patient peers. There's lots of ways we can get into your door as long as the patient has access. And I realize not everybody has access and we have to work very hard for those disparities. Maybe those patients that don't have access, you know, can come to the home unit and, and we can meet there or meet virtually if in the case of pandemics even worse. But we've been fairly successful with virtual visits and virtual education to this point. I suspect as we go out of this pandemic, we'll continue to use virtual visits and virtual education, but more hands-on. Clearly the face-to-face -face is, is, you know, it's needed. It helps through the depression and, and helps through isolation. So hopefully we'll get to that pretty soon. But right now I would say do as much virtually as you can. And when you don't, when you can't, then you bring people in. Thank you. Um, another question, how do you set up a transitioning unit in a hospital or outpatient dialysis unit, staffing machine and ratio, et cetera? So, uh, you know, I, I can only speak from my experience and my preference. I'm certain that there's more ways to do things than what I think is best, but we'll, we'll just go through. So uh, if I were to do a transitional care unit, first of all, I wanna make sure I have enough referral. So I, to understand how big my transitional care unit is, I think about a 30 minute drive to that transitional care unit. And that's different depending where I live, right? Some places 30 minutes is 30 miles, some places 30 minutes is three blocks. So I understand my catchment area, if you will, I should be able to understand how many patients start dialysis in that 30 minute radius over the course of the last year. So I now know how many patients I expect to go through my transitional care unit. And I'll tell you, I'll expect 11%, maybe 10% or so to go home directly. So if you wanna tell me you wanna start on PD, I'm gonna start you on PD, I'm not gonna put you in transitional care. And if you wanna start on home hemo, I'm probably gonna do that as well. And then I'm gonna assume that 75% of the rest We'll go through my transitional care, understanding that every patient will agree to it, understanding some patients may not be appropriate because they don't have the mental faculties to process or their nursing home patients or whatever. So I'll know what the number is. And then I, then I want to have enough chairs. I figure it's a four-way course. It's just a matter of math. I would go two shifts. So staffing a smaller one is in an in-center unit with four bays, two shifts, one nurse, maybe a tech. If I can go to six because I have enough of a catchment area, then clearly a nurse in attack. Uh, and then you, know, you, you work on how to staff it based on what the needs are. But this is a nurse that focuses on only those four to six patients, right? Or two to six patients, depending on what size you make it, and doesn't take care of the rest of the patients in the dialysis unit. So the important thing is to put the resources in place and then you can work on what the performer looks like and what the staffing looks like. But, Obviously, the nurses is, 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 is very important. The dietitian and social worker, likewise, are important, but they're going to be shared with the in-center unit, obviously. There's not enough 
volume there to, to keep them full time. Thanks, Dr. Krause. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Um, are there any assisted HHD programs that are available? Not in the United States. Um, there is some discussion with that, and obviously there's lots of concerns with CMS because there's costs to it. There may be some developing in the voluntary model in the future, we'll see. But uh, yeah, assisted hemo is rare, uh, and assisted PD is rare in this country today. Uh, it's going to take a while to get there. It, it has its value, but you know, I, you know, we don't want to just move in center dialysis in the home. We want, we want. My goal would be if I'm assisted is to, the plan is that I'm getting you to the point where you can do it without my assistance. And one more question: Did you say that a patient can go from transitional care to urgent starts? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Well, maybe not urgent start. Maybe you'll place that PD catheter in, and it'll mature for that week. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I placed well over a thousand PD catheters in my life. I was never worried about starting early. So to me, it wasn't urgent start. It was as the patient needed it. I would like to place the PD catheter, have training over two weeks, and then start PD in two weeks, uh, which some people think is urgent start. But if a patient needs full peritoneal dialysis, you, you can do that right out of the transitional care unit. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Sorry, Casey. And it looks like we do have a couple more questions here for you, Dr. Sure. Krause. So you mentioned that people are at, are at highest risk in the first several weeks of dialysis. What are some of the reasons for that? And do failed transplant patients contribute to this initial spike in mortality? Um, Failed transplant patients fit right in to that initial spike, but no, it's everybody. And some of it is, as you might imagine, right? Somebody's really sick in the hospital. They're got a, maybe they've got a, a malignant disease and the family still wants to dialyze. Those patients aren't going to live very long, right? So some of that's there, but that's not the bulk of it. The, the real reason is, as you can imagine, first of all, when you think about kidney disease, it's a heart disease. So, Let's let's start there. So it's a heart disease in a group of patients that are frequently volume overloaded. Difficult to control a thrice weekly dialysis and to get them, you know, we've all taken this patient. We take five kilos off one day, they come back on in four kilos in two days. So we're in that process, you know, and they're not getting the education as aggressively as they could. So, so the goal is more frequent dialysis to get and keep the weight down to manage them into it, to take care of their grief so they, that we can reduce some of those issues. So the, the, the problem is obviously they're sick, they're starting a new therapy, which is dangerous, right? Dialysis is not a safe therapy. You, you, it has its morbidity. And so we need to deliver it the best way we can. And I believe more frequent is, is a good way to do that. And I think that will help as well. Okay. And do you find that patients that go through a TCU do better with their adherence? Um, yeah, I believe that will be the outset. Dr. Taylor and his one in Delaware clearly showed that early on that he was having much better adherence. Um, self dialysis units, frankly, in center have suggested better adherence. And I suspect that we're going to see long term a well educated patient that understands what it's like to feel good with less symptoms on dialysis will understand the need to come to dialysis to, to work on their fluids and their medicines. They're not going to be perfect, none of us are. Uh, but yes, I think the TCUs will help us with adherence. That makes sense. And then do you find that referrals and getting access takes longer? Uh, that is a local issue, right? This is a discussion that you should, your surgeons should be having with your nephrologist. It shouldn't just be the nurse or the technician left alone, and certainly just a phone call. In, in my mind, the only way we're going to get better access is to have open transparency with our surgeons, understand how long it takes. Not, you know, the, the answer is not, I referred the patient to the surgeon. I got to know how long it takes from the referral to the first clinic visit and from the first clinic visit to the OR. And I need to discuss with the surgeon ways to speed that up because every single day with a catheter is a day too long. So that's very important. The same thing is in PD. Some of our surgeons will be more interested in being quicker. Certainly interventional uh, nephrology and radiology is taking a big uh, role in PD catheter placement that's growing every year. So 
you know, using what's available in your network, understanding that maybe you need to change your referral patterns to get that outcomes you want to, is how you drive it. Uh, you know, so that's a market by market question, um, but it's one that you need to look at and you need to take seriously. That's a very good question. Got a couple of more questions that have come in through sure. chat. Um, someone asked, are AKI patients eligible for Urgent Start PD or admission to TCU? Well, that's a very good question, and I'll give you a very honest answer. So today, if CMS is paying for the AKI, they're not able to go home. They're not able to go to PD or home hemodialysis because uh, CMS mandates that they're taking care of in center for AKI. However, we, we have seen an insurance company call us up and say, we'd like Mr. Smith to do PD for his AKI. Will you do it? Of course, we'll do it. That's not the problem. So the home is a, a difficult spot because in today's world, it's not reimbursed for home dialysis if you're declared AKI, obviously. As soon as you're declared ESRD, we can start home dialysis. I personally believe that TCUs can be a very good place for AKI because my nurse is taking care of less patients, has more attention to details. It will require that we develop the curriculum for AKI patients, right? I, I personally believe that you should be teaching them about ESRD care and modality as well because I know a third of them are going to go to ESRD, a third of them are going to die, and a third of them will get uh, come off dialysis. However, of those third to come off dialysis, they don't go back to a creatinine one, right? They, they go to CKD four, maybe early five. So they're likely to come back. So the education on modalities to me is important, but the education on how to monitor your AKI is also important. So I think a TCU will be an excellent place for AKI care. And I anticipate that you're gonna be seeing some of that in the future as well, as long as we have capacity. Thank you, Dr. Kraus. Uh, Miriam, are you questions? Absolutely they are. These are some great questions. questions. <laughs> um, Miriam or Stacy, have either one of you seen any more? Or am I missing anything here? Um, I see one more question here. Um, we got in the chat. There are no transitional care units in my state of Florida. Do you know where these units are up and running? Oh, there are transitional care units in the state of Florida. I know Fresenius has some. Uh, it's it's a matter of talking to your your dialysis organizations or talking to other ones if you're interested in that without you know it, you know how the world is so it, there are some in Florida I don't know exactly where they are but you know I know our company has them so uh, you know you could reach out to us and we can tell you where they are um, there'll be more Florida's you know every state's a good state but Florida's a good state because it's densely populated which means it's densely populated with ESRD as well. Um, so, so it's a matter of talking to your dialysis organization. So I really think transitional care is good. I think most of us are getting it. And I think most of us will be in the transitional care world before too long. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Um, someone says nephrologist buy-in and putting social workers out in the field educating patients before discharge is important for referrals as these programs don't seem to grow that I have seen. Has this been considered best place to start as hospitals and our discharge planners do not have time to do necessary education? So I will tell you that I suspect the rollout of TCUs has not been perfect. So I suspect there are many of my TCUs that are under capacity. And so first thing first, if I'm gonna set up a TCU, I'm gonna sit down with the nephrologist in the area. And I want commitment and buy-in that they're going to refer their patients there. It does me no good to build a unit that people don't refer to because they don't understand or they're unwilling to make that change in culture. So my first step is always with the nephrologist. But absolutely, I'm at the, the door of the hospital. I'm talking to the care coordinator because all the care coordinator wants is somebody to take the patient. So the care coordinator needs to know, you call my dialysis unit or you call my transitional care unit and you have a hepatitis B negative antigen, you're there. The, the answer is yes. We'll worry about the insurance and everything else down the road. We'll take your patient. One phone call, we'll take the patient tomorrow, right? The, the, it should be that simple and that's, you're absolutely right. You've got to be able to be the first choice of anybody starting dialysis, which means the care coordinators in the hospital have to understand it. The physicians have to understand it. 
the in-center acute nurse unit nurses and techs and whoever else who are touching my patient have to understand it because everybody has to say a positive thing. In the early days of rehab hospitals, the patients would say, I don't want to go to another hospital. I want to go home. So you had to explain to them why rehab was important. Same explanation for TCU. It, it, it really takes all that buy-in. Thank you, Dr. Krause. Well, it looks like we've come up on time. Um, I, I do, do want to thank you again. Uh, thanks so much for the excellent presentation. It was very thorough, lots of great information. And Stacy and Miriam, thanks to you as well for your collaboration on this webinar. And I also want to thank everybody else who was able to join us this afternoon. And just as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and the recording as well as the CEC certificate will be provided in the following week. Um, so thank you all again, and I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Get your vaccines. <laughs>